do magic tricks with the periodic table. And we have our groups, um, group numbers written in purple. Those, of course, are the columns that go down. Boop, 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 boop. We have our period numbers written in red, and those are, of course, the rows that go across. Great. So here's the magic trick. I'm going to close my eyes, and I'm going to put my stylus down some. Oh, no, that didn't work. Okay. All right, well, this one right here. If I want to write the electron configuration for this, and it does help if I have helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon written in. That's all I need, and I will now, without doing anything, write the noble gas notation for this element. I have no idea what this element is. I don't know how many electrons it has. There's nothing on this periodic table. This is like Penn and Teller. There's nothing up my sleeve. There's nothing in my hat. Wait, I'm not wearing a hat. This right there has a configuration of, okay, Wyatt, start me off. Krypton 5s2. Tread carefully. Tread carefully, sir. You can do it. Lagging by one, 4D1. <laughs> we just pulled that right straight out of our hat, out of thin air. We didn't count electrons. We didn't do anything. How do we do this magic trick? You will see when you watch the video from class on Tuesday. Okay, so the question being, you know, what if I had something that had an F block? that was F block or that had F's filled. The thing to remember, and it's not really clear on most periodic tables, I will say that, is that the F block basically is coming from here. So it's in rows six and it's in period six and seven. So as long as you're above six and seven, you don't have to worry you don't have anything filling in F. Um, and let me let me actually grab the illustration of the expanded version because it does make so much more sense that way. If we look at this one, this is the expanded periodic table um, done by Dr. Van Brainer. And, you know, if we were to do the same thing and randomly stick a pin, so here we ended up picking copper, how would we do the noble gas notation for that? Well, argon and then let's see, one, two, three, four. So four S two, three D, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we realize that until we get to the sixth row, we don't even need to worry about the the, the F blocks called lanthanide and actinide series because um, lanthanum and actinium, I think I'm getting those right, are what started off. So if you're using a periodic table that doesn't have F block in it, um, like this, then you just want to key on the fact that it, um, that's how that works. Questions? Okay, so that was, that was our magic trick. Okay, it's not as impressive as it could be. But now we're going to talk a little bit more about some characteristics of atoms that we can predict based on their arrangement on the periodic table. So we can predict electron configuration really quickly, really simply, and you kind of already knew that, you just didn't know the magic party trick. We're going to start to talk a little bit about atomic radii. So this is more about electron configuration and periodic properties, and what does atomic radii have to do with electron configuration? Well, I'm glad you asked. So first, let's establish what atomic radii is. Um, it's half the distance between the nuclei of two identical atoms that are bonded together. So let me draw that for you. Here we've got two little nitrogens. Um, I would like you to remember that these are all just sort of images that we use. They're like visual cues. Nitrogen atoms do not have ends stamped on them. That's important to know. Really, it is. So when we measure atomic radius, you know what the radius of a circle is. What we're measuring is one half 
of the distance between these nuclei. Okay, so the radius is half of that distance. And we have to measure radius when they're bonded, and we have to measure radius when an atom is bonded to something that is identical to it. And we'll talk more about why that is later. So, if we go from group 1 and we move across a period to group 18, atomic radius shrinks. Huh. And if we start at the top of a group and go down that group, the atomic radius increases. So let's actually look at what we're saying. Okay. So we're actually going to start with the second bullet on that slide. We're going we're to sort of start here. That as we go down a group, atomic radii tend to increase. And we're starting there because this one is kind of intuitive. It kind of makes sense. So that means that if we look at two atoms of fluorine that are bonded together and compare them to two atoms of chlorine that are bonded together and compare them to two atoms of bromine that are bonded together, we're going to see that those keep getting bigger, that radius. And that makes sense. Why does that make sense? What are we adding as we go down a period? The period is the same as the highest occupied main energy level. Yeah, the period is the same as the highest occupied main energy level. What's the highest main energy level that fluorine has? Two. So let's, well, I'm going to sketch that. Okay, so I've got fluorine there. Fluorine has two electrons on the first main energy level. It's full. And then it's got seven on the second main energy level. It's almost full. It would really dearly love to pick one up so that it could be just like um, the noble gas that it so admires, neon. But it's got two main energy levels. Okay. Now, we know that they're not really concentric rings, a la who? Who's, whose model was the little concentric rings, like little racetracks? Bohr. Yeah, good. So we know they're not really these little concentric rings that go further and further away from the nucleus, but it's not a terrible model. The electron clouds do tend to get um, further from the nucleus as we add energy levels. So the, the 1s is closer to the nucleus than the outer limits of the 2s, and the 3s is farther away from the nucleus than the 1s. So, I mean, it's, it's a useful visual model, even though we know this is not reality. Well, so when we look at chlorine, and when we look at chlorine, we would expect that chlorine would have a bigger radius, wouldn't we? It's got a whole other energy level. We would expect that this would be a larger atom. That makes perfect sense. And then let's look at bromine. Let's go down one more. Okay, there's bromine. Isn't she pretty? She has got 17 electrons on the uppermost main energy level. Oh, wait. No, she doesn't. Hold on. I screwed that up. Those additional 10 are 3D. Those are on the third main energy level. So she, she bromine is in 1, 2, 3, 4... So on that uppermost level, it's got a 4s2, 4p5. So bromine's a pretty large atom, wouldn't you say? A lot happening there. We're out to the fourth main energy level. We would expect bromine to be fluffier than fluoride. So we're not really shocked that um, bromine is larger than chlorine and chlorine is larger than fluorine. But there's more to it than what's obvious, and that's why I start with this one. So we looked at a piece of paper. Well, we looked at some paper clips and a magnet, and I can actually defeat gravity. I can defeat the entire mass of the Earth and pull those paper clips upward.
with a little magnet. But when I put a piece of paper over the paper clips, I have to get closer to them before they feel my pull, my irresistible pull. What's going on there? How does this relate to atoms, Moser? I think you're off on a crazy tangent. So, let's think about what is holding those electrons in, and again, we're going we're gonna to sort of fall back on that old Bohr model and we're going to say, in orbit. We know they're not on little racetracks around the nucleus, but it's a, it's a good analogy. So let's think about what holds those electrons in orbit around the nucleus. What is it? What? Oh, we'll pick it up in four minutes. Okay, so when we last left our, our chemistry heroes, we were thinking about what the heck is keeping those electrons in their metaphorical orbit around the nucleus. So what's the charge on electrons? Negative. What's in the nucleus? What's the charge on the nucleus? Positive. What happens between two opposite forces? They're attracted to one another. Yeah. So the, the nucleus is pulling those electrons in. So I'm going to give you, I give you once more, fluorine. I'll just put a little F here. And of course, fluorine only has two main energy levels filled, so I'm going to get rid of those guys. So there's, there's my fluorine. Yay. And fluorine, you might recall, and I'm going to make my electrons here yellow. That seems reasonable. Shows up. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven electrons. So how many protons are in fluorine's nucleus? How many? Look at your periodic table, please. The one that has numbers on it. Nine. Nine. Because remember, there are two on the inner. Seven's just the outer. I know, that gets confusing. People do that all the time. You're not the first person to do that. I've done that. So fluorine has got nine. I'm just going to replace it here. Nine little protons. And those nine protons are pulling on those electrons. And as they exert force, whoops, as they exert force on those electrons, they pull, they compress the atom. They actually sort of pull it in tighter and snugger. This is you on a winter day pulling your coat a little bit closer. Okay. And those outer electrons, the farthest thing that they have to pull on, there's only one sheet of paper, or should we say one energy level, between that nucleus and those outer electrons. So they have a pretty good chance of reining this thing in pretty well. They can keep a pretty close eye on those outer electrons. So let's go down one period. Let's go down one in that group. And let's look at chlorine. So chlorine, we've got a whole new energy level. And we've got the nucleus, the chlorine's nucleus, exerting a force pulling those electrons in towards the nucleus. How many neutrons does chlorine have? I'm sorry, how many protons? Jeez, Louise Moser. How many? 17. So chlorine has 17 protons pulling on 17 electrons, exerting a force, pulling them inward. All of them. Okay. Well, it's a lot more to keep track of a whole lot more to keep track of. And how many main energy levels are between the nucleus and those outer electrons? Why two? So there is a degree to which those outer electrons are shielded from the force of the nucleus. We actually call this very So we actually call this electron shielding. Those outer electrons are being shielded from the attractive force of the nucleus 
by those energy levels that exist between the nucleus and those outer levels. So the more energy levels we have between the nucleus and those outer levels, sort of the harder it is to get a grip on those outer electrons. This is kind of like a family with two kids. Somebody's keeping you in line at all times. Versus a family with 18 kids. What's the youngest one doing? Who knows? Nobody knows. These outer electrons in really large atoms are like the 18th of 18 children. Nobody actually knows what they're doing. Nobody knows if they have lunch. Are they alive? Okay, good. It's about all we can be concerned with. We don't know if they have clean underwear. We just don't know. <laughs> Too much. Those outer electrons don't feel as much of a force of attraction to the nucleus because there's so much between them. There's so much distance. There's so much shielding that goes on. So the more energy levels we put between the nucleus and the outer electrons, the less attraction they have and the bigger the atom tends to get, the fluffier the atom tends to get. We've added energy levels, and there are only seven electrons on that outer energy level being attracted to the nucleus. So when we ask the question, when we say atomic radii generally increase going down a group, and we say, why? Why? Well, we've added energy levels. We've added um, electrons to the atom. But the big thing is we've added energy levels. And so the nucleus cannot exert a strong a pull on the outer electrons due to electron shielding. And so the radius of the atom tends to increase as we go down a group. That one's actually pretty easy to understand, I think. I think that's the one that's pretty obvious and pretty intuitive. When you draw fluorine versus chlorine versus bromine, you look at the three of them and you go, oh, well, bromine's totally going to be bigger. Even though, remember, the little concentric rings are just a mechanism that we use to understand it. Um, in this case, the mechanism makes it look pretty obvious, even though it's not that obvious. So here's the trickier part. Atomic radii decrease as we go from group 1 to group 18. Huh? So again, let's look at what that means. Carbon's got 6 protons, 6 electrons, and 4 of those electrons are on the uppermost main energy level, which means that it's not too terribly difficult for the nucleus to get a good grip on the outer level and pull it in pretty snug, actually. Now, I mean, I'm exaggerating the size difference here. Um, Clearly, let's see, this was carbon, that's boron, that's beryllium, that's lithium. So next up, we have nitrogen. We went over one more space, we added one more proton. So we have seven protons, we have seven electrons, and five of them are on that upper most energy level. One, two, three, four, five. So the nucleus has got a lot of sort of stuff to get a good grip on. And as a result, the radius is going to be even smaller. The more electrons you have on the outermost energy level, the better a sort of a grip the nucleus can get on it and the smaller the radius tends to be. So something that has one valence electron is going to be a much fluffier atom, and I, I do actually use the word fluffy because I kind of always visualize pulling a cotton, compressing a cotton ball. You know, if there's some force in the center of the cotton ball, pulling it all inward. If it can't really get a grip on the edges, it's a pretty fluffy cotton ball. Um, things that have a lot of electrons on the uppermost main energy level, basically your group 17s, your halogens, because these all have seven valence electrons, they're going to tend to be pretty fluffy atoms. They do not, they, they, they have a really strong grip on those outer electrons. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So let's, let's play a little game. Okay, I've given you four elements. You will need a periodic table that has... Um, some letters on it. And what I would like you to do is arrange these from largest. Well, actually, let's go 
let's go in increasing order. Smallest. To largest. Oh. Michaela, what do you and your buddy have as your smallest atom here? Potassium. You have potassium as your smallest. Yeah. Okay. So you say smallest is potassium. And what's next? Zinc. Zinc. And then? Bior. Bromine. And then? TR. Titanium. Okay, is everyone in agreement with Michaela and her friends? I don't know. I don't know who her friends are. She has lots of them. I don't know if the island is cohesive or the island is not cohesive. Okay, so we have disagreement. We have dissension in the ranks. And I, I should tell you, why do you should start playing the mistake game in here? We do this in physics where you have to put up an answer with an intentional mistake and then explain your logic. And everybody else has to find your mistake. Okay, so we have disagreement. Give me an alternative arrangement. Let's see. Do we have widespread disagreement? Okay. Lucas, you give me what you got. You and who who is your buddy? Are you are you communicating from your island? Are you sending coconuts with messages yeah. to the mainland? Good. Okay. What do you and your friends have? The Smallest. Bromine. Bromine followed by? Zinc. Zinc followed by? Titanium. Titanium followed by? Potassium. Potassium. Okay. Do we have, do other people have this? Okay. Do we have anything else? Is there anybody who does not have either one of these? <laughs> he has a third possibility. Okay. All right. So, Lucas. Why would bromine be the smallest? It's got the most protons and the most electrons and the most neutrons. Because of the outer layer mm -hmm. is fuller and has okay. more electrons. Okay. So there's more places for the for the nucleus okay. to pull in. Okay. So you're saying that because there are more electrons on the outermost occupied energy level that the forces of the nucleus can, in essence, get like a better grip yeah. and pull it in tighter. Okay. Anybody agree with that logic? Okay. So here's the nice part about these kind of questions, because I will give you these kind of questions on tests and quizzes. Um, if you, and I, I will encourage you to write the following. Let me get one more periodic table up here. Jeez Louise. And it could be blank, it could be whatever. I kind of like the blank because it forces you to not count and just think about patterns um, without sort of the distraction of what these elements really are. So, um, ah, radius, can't even spell radius. Here we go. Radius decreases as we go that way. That's a helpful mnemonic. And then all you have to do is put them in the order that they appear within a single period, but sort of backwards, reading in reverse. And the other thing to write is, of course, still can't spell radius. <laughs> oh. So if you put those two trends on your periodic table, it's really helpful because you can just look at the periodic table and say, oh yeah, okay, I've got all these things that are within a period. I know that the smallest thing is going to be whatever is over on this end, and the largest thing is going to be whatever's over on this end, and all I have to do is put them in reverse order. So let's try some things within a group. Polonium, oxygen, uh, selenium, and sulfur. Put them in order from smallest to largest atomic radius. Okay, um, we have a group claiming that it goes oxygen would be the smallest, followed by sulfur, followed by selenium, and polonium would be the big boy on this block. Agreement? Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, because oxygen is at the top of the group, it's going to have um, the lowest number of energy levels. It's going to have the least electron shielding, so the nucleus of oxygen can get a much better grip on its outermost occupied energy level than something like polonium, which has electrons occupying, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, occupying 6s and 6p. That's way the heck out. That's, you know, very, very far from sort of the center of activity. Okay, now let's do one that's a little bit trickier. Okay, arrange once again. Smallest to largest, sodium, chlorine, silicone, and carbon. Go. Okay, so we had someone start to go, and they said, they said sodium, and then they said, no, nope, no, nope, wait, never mind, I, nope, they rescinded. Sorry, no, it lagged. I, I put SN, and then I erased it, and, but it lagged. So SN was only up there for a fraction of a moment, but apparently it froze there. Sorry, go again. My apologies. Do you did you have the right ones, Michael, or did you have SN also? No, we have SI. Okay. SI and C. So sodium, chlorine, silicone, and carbon. The vagaries of technology. Okay, who's ready to go? Whoops, that was still recording. Okay, we have someone saying chlorine, silicone, carbon, and then sodium. Do we have agreement? Does anybody want to fight him? <laughs> I'll take you on. That is not the right order. Y'all like this. Okay? What do you have? I have carbon, chlorine, silicone, sodium. Okay. We have proposed as an alternative carbon, chlorine, silicone, sodium. So let's look at things that we're all in agreement on. We are all in agreement that sodium is definitely the biggest atom here, largest atomic radius. Why? Why? Uh, yeah, it, it's group one. It's sodium is all the way at the far left side of the periodic table. It's got a pretty large radius. Doesn't have a whole lot of shielding for its um, group. Okay, now it looks as though we all agree that chlorine is larger than silicone. Is that true? Or I'm sorry, it's smaller. Jeez Louise Moser, fix that. That chlorine is smaller than silicone. Is that true? Why? Okay, chlorine's over farther. It has more electrons in the outer shell. Basically, Chlorine is going to have a decreased radius because it's got a large number of valence electrons, a large number of electrons in that uppermost energy level, more than silicone does. So, yeah, I would say that this is a correct assertion. Yes, that's true. Yes, that's true. Now, the question is, where does carbon fit in here? So, what can we relate carbon to? Yeah, go ahead. It's what? Okay, so here's the thing. We don't have absolute sizes for any of these. It's all relative. This one's bigger than this one. This one's smaller than this one. We're not measuring here. We're just giving relatives. So we can only compare things within a period or within a group. What did I do to you here? What mean horrible thing did I do? Uh-huh. I gave you three things that are from the third period, and then I gave you carbon, which is second period. 
Is carbon in a group with any of these? Why, yes, it is. What's carbon in a group with? Silicone. So we can compare carbon and silicone. We can't compare carbon and anything else here. We can only compare things if they're in the same group or the same period. What do we know to be true of carbon and silicone? Looking at your periodic table. Carbon is going to be smaller. Why? It's got a lower occupied energy level. There's going to be less electron um, shielding compared to silicone. So we know that carbon is going to be smaller than silicone. Well, wait a second. Then we have a problem here. So when you're approaching a problem like this, here's the thing you got to do. We know for a fact that sodium is going to be the biggest. We know for a fact that chlorine, because it's group 17, is going to be the smallest here. We know that silicone is smaller than chlorine. The only question that's left for us is where does carbon fit in? And what we have to remember is that we can only compare it to things that are in either the same period or the same group. So we can only compare carbon and silicone. And we know that carbon is period two, silicone's period three. Which will be larger, carbon or silicone? Silicone. Carbon is going to be smaller than silicone. So carbon is going to go right in there very neatly. So that's the thing to remember is you can't always do these super fast. And actually nobody got this one right. And carbon is the wild card in that. Carbon is the tricker. And that's okay. Um, when, and I will give you problems like this on tests and quizzes where you have you know, a bunch of things out of one group and then one that's not in that group. Or a bunch of things out of one period and one that's not in that period. So that's the sort of process you have to be able to perform. I'm going to give you a few more homework problems to get started on to practice this, and tomorrow we start talking about making ions.